Hello. Today, let's look at an interesting differential equation problem. It is about free fall from a great height. The question says: Find the time t it takes for a body initially at rest to fall to the surface of the Earth. The initial height h measured from the Earth's surface is so great that the gravity cannot be regarded as uniform. Also, we ignore air resistance. So, to solve this problem, we first need to formulate a differential equation, then. Solve the differential equation, and finally analyze the solution behavior. Let's go.、Um, so this is our diagram. The coordinate axis x points vertically upward. The origin is set at the surface of the Earth, not the center. And h is the initial height, and r is the Earth's radius. So according to Newton's second law, mass times acceleration is equal to the force. In this case, the force is just gravity. So we have m times the acceleration, that is the second-order derivative of x with respect to t, is equal to minus g r squared times m over x plus r squared. We have a minus sign on the right-hand side because gravity acts downwards. Here, little g is the acceleration due to gravity on Earth's surface. On the denominator, we have x plus r squared. This is the distance between the object and the center of the Earth squared. So we're using the inverse square law for gravity. This implicitly assumes that Earth is a spherically symmetric body, which is approximation of the actual Earth. Canceling out m on both sides, and we get d squared x over d t squared equals to minus g r squared over x plus r squared. This is a nonlinear second-order differential equation. And also, we have the initial conditions. x zero is h. And the initial velocity, namely dx over dt, when t is equal to zero, is equal to zero, because the object is initially at rest. This completes the formulation of an initial value problem. To solve or to integrate this differential equation requires a special trick. It exploits the fact that in the differential equation, the independent variable t does not appear explicitly. We write v as dx over dt. This is, of course, the velocity. Then we can rewrite the acceleration as dv over dx times v. Here are the details. So the second order derivative is simply the first order derivative of the first order derivative. So we have d over dx of dx over dt, but dx over dt is just v. So we have dv over dt. Then we can use the chain rule to write dv over dt as dv over dx times dx over dt. So dx over dt shows up again, which we simply rewrite as v. This is a standard trick for handling second-order differential equations in which the independent variable does not appear. So the differential equation becomes dv over dx times v equals to minus g r squared over x plus r squared. This is a separable differential equation, so we can use the method of separation of variables to solve it. Separating the variables v and x to each side of the equation, and we have v times dv equals to minus g r squared over x plus r squared times dx. We can then integrate both sides. The integrations are easy to perform. The integral of v dv gives half v squared. And integrating the right-hand side, we have g r squared over x plus r plus c1, where c1 is an arbitrary integration constant. And we note that this is actually the energy conservation. That is, if we multiply m on both sides, we get half m v squared, which is the kinetic energy, plus the negative of m g r squared over x plus r. That is, the potential energy due to gravity is a constant. Now let's plug in the initial conditions to determine c1. Set v equals to zero and x equals to h in the result of integration, and we get zero equals to g r squared over h plus r plus c1. Therefore, the constant c1 of integration is just minus g r squared over h plus r. Substituting the value of c1 back into our result of integration, and we have half v squared. Equals to g r squared over x plus r, minus g r squared over h plus r. Rearrange the right hand side, and we get g r squared over h plus r times h minus x over x plus r. 
To summarize, now we have a first order differential equation for x of t. That is dx over dt squared equals to v squared equals to 2gr squared over h plus r. Notice this is just a big constant here, times h minus x over x plus r. Recalling that the body is falling downward, so dx over dt is negative. So by taking the negative square root, we have dx over dt equals to the minus of the square root of 2gr squared over h plus r times the square root of h minus x over x plus r. This is once again a separable differential equation, so we separate the variables and then integrate. So by separating the variables, we have the square root of x plus r over h minus x times dx equals to minus the square root of 2gr squared over h plus r times dt. We then integrate both sides. This time, we use definite integrals to incorporate the initial and final conditions. The integral on the left-hand side over the distance ranges from 0 to h, and the right-hand side is integral over time from big T to 0. The lower limits corresponds to the final condition. That is, at time big T, x becomes 0 and the upper limits corresponds to the initial condition. At time 0, the height is h. The right-hand side is just integrating a constant, which is very easy. So the right-hand side is big T times the square root of 2gr squared over h plus r. So our focus now is integrating the left-hand side. For that, we may first use a u substitution. We substitute the denominator, the square root of h minus x, to be u. Taking differentials on both sides in our substitution, we get minus one-half of h minus x to the minus one-half dx equals to du. This has the advantage of bringing together the denominator and dx into a multiple of du. Also, under our substitution, x is just h minus u squared. To complete our substitution, we still need to find the new integration limits. When x is equal to h, u, which is the square root of h minus x, is just 0. And when x is 0, u is square root of h. So the new lower limit is the square root of h, and the new upper limit is 0. But considering du also have a negative sign, we may reverse the order of the new integration limits to get rid of the minus sign. This puts the integral on the left-hand side to the integral from 0 to the square root of h of 2 times the square root of h plus r minus u squared times du. So now the new integral has a familiar form. This is the square root of a quadratic, for which we can use trick substitution. So let's do that. So based on the form, the square root of h plus r, which is a constant, minus u squared, we substitute u to be the square root of h plus r times the sine of theta. This brings the square root of h plus r minus u squared to the square root of h plus r times the cosine of theta. Taking differentials, and we get du equals to the square root of h plus r times cosine theta times d theta. We also need new integration limits. When u is equal to 0, theta is equal to 0. When u is the square root of h, that means the sine of theta is the square root of h over the square root of h plus r. So that gives the upper limit of theta, namely the inverse sine of the square root of h over h plus r, which we denote as theta naught. Putting all of those things together, we have the integral of the left-hand side, which is the integral from 0 to the square root of h, 2 times the square root of h plus r minus u squared du, is equal to the integral from 0 to theta naught, 2 times h plus r times cosine squared of theta, d theta. This is essentially an integral of cosine squared. To handle this, we use the double angle formula. First, we pull out the constant h plus r. 2 times the cosine squared of theta is 1 plus cosine of 2 theta. This is very easy to integrate. So we get h plus r times theta plus 1 half sine of 2 theta. That's the antiderivative. We then evaluate the antiderivative at theta naught and zero and take their difference according to the fundamental theorem of calculus. 
when theta equals to zero, the expression is just zero. So we have h plus r times theta naught plus one half of sine two theta naught, which by the double angle formula is sine of theta naught times cosine of theta naught. We then plug in the value of theta naught, which is inverse sine of the square root of h over h plus r. And cosine of theta naught is the square root of r over h plus r. Simplify the expression and we get h plus r times the inverse sine of the square root of h over h plus r plus the square root of h times r. So now we're done with the integral on the left hand side. Therefore, the left hand side of the integral, which we just evaluated, is equal to the right hand side, that is t over the square root of 2gr squared over h plus r from which we can easily solve for t. So there we have it. This is a time for free fall when gravity is non-uniform, which then begs the question, how does this solution behave? We know that under uniform gravity, t is the square root of 2h over g. We now show that the formula for t we just derived recovers the uniform gravity solution when h is small. When h is much less than r, the argument of the inverse sine function is close to zero. So we can use the approximation, the inverse sine of x is approximately x. So here we have the inverse sine of the square root of h over h plus r is approximately the square root of h over h plus r. We then substitute this approximation into the formula for t to see what happens. So we have when h is small compared to r, we bring out the common factor of the square root of h to the front and we get the square root of h over 2g times h plus r over r plus the square root of h plus r over r. So when h is small, h plus r over r is approximately 1. So the two terms in the bracket are both approximately 1. And together with the factor at the front simplifies to the square root of 2h over g, which is exactly the uniform gravity solution. So now let's think about what happens when h is large. The argument of the inverse sine function will be approximately 1. So the inverse sine term is approximately half pi. And the second term in the bracket, which is the square root of h over r, would be much smaller than the first term, which is roughly a linear term, h plus r over r. Therefore, when h is large, t is approximately proportional to the 3 half power of h plus r. So here I plotted the relationship between big T and the dimensionless variable h over r. That is the height of the free fall compared to Earth's radius. As we can see, when h is relatively large, the graph looks like a power law. And by our analysis, this is the power roughly 3 half. And if we zoom in near the origin, we can see the function roughly behaves like a square root. And that's the uniform gravity solution. That's it for today's video. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.